as thousands descend on Austin, Texas for the 2023 International Association of City and County Management Association's annual meeting, ICMA leaders are reimagining local government and we are covering their new initiative from every angle. You're watching ICMA TV. This is ICMA TV. Starting now as ICMA TV. Welcome back to day three of ICMA TV. I'm Andrea Godfrey. Local government reimagined. That's the new initiative that, among other things, is focusing on educating local leaders about drivers of mobility. Today, we will dive deep into what is working to improve the welfare of vulnerable residents. The reality is that we're facing a very different future than we have faced in our past, and we need to change our communities to respond to that future. Tackling the ongoing challenge of affordable housing, we talk with one expert from the National Housing Trust. Plus, we sit down with the Economic Mobility Cohort to find out what policies are helping move the needle in the right direction in disadvantaged communities. And we see firsthand the cities and counties finding innovative ways to incubate business opportunities. There is so much in store ahead and plenty of ways for you to watch. You can always find the latest ICMA TV episode on the TV's place throughout the convention center, on the homepage of the ICMA meeting website where you can click through the playlist to find even more extensive meeting content, on the ICMA conference app, and on our YouTube and X pages formerly known as Twitter. During the past year, ICMA has offered a series of learning and training opportunities to 10 different localities, all focused on boosting upward mobility. Members of the Economic Mobility Cohort join us now here in studio to explain. Thank you both for your time today. Glad to be here. All right, let's get started with some of the ideas that you generated that led to you being selected as one of the 10 localities. So Grand Island, Nebraska uh, is my hometown and I moved back there a year ago and one of the things I noticed was that transit really had not changed much in 25 years. Uh, we have a dial ride system that's very well used, very heavily used, very popular with the users, but not conducive to for someone who wants to use public transportation to get to work or to technical training. You have to schedule it a day in advance um, and you have to do that every time you want to use it. So wow. definitely not convenient for someone looking to commute. So. What we um, put together was a proposal to partner with our community college and with our high school to actually connect our residents with jobs and technical training through some type of different mode of transportation. And that was our proposal to ICMA that we would put together that and we'd come up with an implementable plan um, and get that underway and going. Uh, it's not quite what we end up with, but that's what we started with. Okay, very creative. So transportation needs. James, what about you? Absolutely. So I'm in Chesterfield County, Virginia, and we're a community of about 370,000 residents. And so right away, we saw also, similar to Laura, transportation is certainly important, but workforce development is another piece that we saw that was important. Also, financial literacy uh, was important as well. So our focus, among many, what we're going to focus just on a couple, for workforce development, financial literacy, to make that and move forward in our community. How we did that, we started to put together what I call micro conferences or micro sessions, and we moved out into, into the community and start having the, uh, micro events. That's amazing, and you are a little bit further along in the process, so let's kind of elaborate on some of the success stories that you've seen. Moving into uh, the program that we currently have, we call them pop-up events. Um, LEAP is one of our learning educational programs that we have in the community, and I mentioned the partnerships with the YMCA, which was one of our community events we had. And so we had these sessions, and they were about 20 to 30 minutes each, focus on workforce development, so partnering with the local community college, um, partnering with our human resource department as we bring in individuals to, hey, you, we know that people need jobs, but they don't often have the job skills um, ready and, or know how to fill out even a basic application, a resume. So having staff on hand to work with individuals to do that. There's lots of incredible uh, success stories there. Laura, I want to ask you, um, for both feedback that you hear from your community members and then also the data that you gather, what are some of the biggest barriers to upward mobility that you find? The first barrier we hit was um, disbelief that a problem existed, that people actually had a need or that they would use a different mode of transportation if we provided it. Um, so that really was hurdle one, and I had that right in-house in my staff. Wow. Um, yeah, actually we did a press release about getting the grant and I had panic from our transit manager, our public works director, saying, 
how can we implement this? We don't have the funding, we don't have the time, and we don't think there's a problem. So we actually had to kind of pivot um, right away in the grant process and, and working with ICMA to kind of change our scope of work to say, okay, we have to prove the problem exists. Well, and speaking of funding, you have an incredible sponsor in the form of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. How much does that support help with your initiatives? I would have to say that it's, it's huge. We are so thankful for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in partnership with ICMA to make this happen. Otherwise, this is funding that we wouldn't have and we wouldn't be able to try this pilot case to work with um, you know, our, our youth, um, our young adults uh, to make this happen in, in the Chesterfield County community. So again, we extend our heartfelt thanks from all of our board members in Chesterfield County and our, and our county administrator as well. Well, our thanks to the both of you for all of the incredible work that you're doing and certainly our thanks to you for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. As we mentioned earlier, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is working with the ICMA to address economic mobility. Kevin Howard, program officer with the Gates Foundation, is here in studio along with Edith Ramirez, assistant city manager of Morgan Hill, California, to explain how they are working with the ICMA to make sure that no one is unfairly left behind. Thanks to you both. Good morning. Thank you. All right, so Kevin, I want to get started with you. I want to go back to the number of people that are living below the poverty level. We are talking about either an individual making just over $29,000 or $60,000 for a family of four. This is your focus population, is that correct? They're geographically dispersed throughout the U.S. Uh, about half live in very large metros and about 40% live in the South. Um, the plurality of this group is white, but black, let, Latino, uh, indigenous folks are overrepresented and women are also overrepresented. And that just highlights how important it is to understand race and gender when you're thinking about poverty and economic mobility. Um, and that's been a guiding light for how we view the work and how we've designed our strategy. So you found that focus population and then the Gates Foundation created the Economic Mobility and Opportunity Strategy. Can you elaborate on that? We've spent years uh, working in education in the U.S. Um, to improve equitable outcomes and, and quality of education. But still, the research indicates that uh, education alone is often not enough. And there's a lot of other barriers to economic mobility. And so. We started this work um, around 2016 uh, with the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty. It included faith-based uh, groups, practitioners, researchers, experts, um, and this group traveled across the country listening to communities, uh, listening to folks in the work in communities every day, and uh, listening to people experiencing poverty. And so this group uh, defined, uh, came up with this conception of mobility and included uh, financial indicators, so income, wealth, kind of that traditional bucket of what you would think of as economic mobility but also included uh, a factor of belonging. Do you feel like you belong in your community? And also autonomy. Do you feel like you have uh, autonomy over your life choices? Um, and in 2022, the foundation recommitted to economic mobility, and I'm proud to say that we've committed uh, $460 million over the next four years um, to improve economic outcomes in the U.S. That's amazing. Edith, in your community, what do you hear are some of the biggest barriers to economic mobility? I think that, uh, again, the sense of belonging is where it all starts, both whether it's connecting people to jobs or people to housing. It is almost impossible to really make a dent when people don't feel that they can trust you, that they belong in their community. So. Part of the, the work that we're doing with ICMA, with our learning, is, is walking it back to really the most foundational effort of creating trust and a sense of belonging for people that in some cases are invisible in your community. So Kevin, the Gates Foundation, they created this economic mobility and opportunity strategy, but how did the partnership with ICMA come about? We work with uh, a set of incredible partners that create tools for local governments. Um, and so what our strategy does is we um, support these um, creators of tools and then we uh, try and meet local governments where they are and where they are is with incredible partners like ICMA and um, what ICMA does really well is uh, connect folks um, so they get that peer support, offer the technical assistance to again, meet the governments where they are and, and help them through um, a sometimes winding and complicated mobility journey. 
course. Edith, can you, final question for you, can you kind of explain any success stories that you've seen in your own community? One of the things that we learned through the journey with ICMA, with the Urban Institute, is in addition to um, ensuring that people have housing and jobs, is the concept of social capital. Mm -hmm. The concept of social capital, that if you, as a resident, know and have friends and know who to call if you need something, there is a chance that you're gonna stay above water and there is a chance that you might get that job or there's a chance that you might get that reference. So what we have done in Morgan Hill is that we have taken small but mighty steps on making sure that we're being very intentional in reaching out to that focus group and, and making sure that they know that they have a partner with the city, mm -hmm. that they have social capital, and how do we create that web-based social capital uh, investment for them. And, and that has been a, a good and very exciting part of the shift that Morgan Hill has been doing. Wonderful. Well, this partnership is very important, especially to the residents that we serve. So thank you both so much for all of your work, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. We kick off our tour of cities in Laurel, Maryland today. Capitalizing on their unique location between D.C. and Baltimore, Laurel's city leaders are focused on the economic development of businesses while residents enjoy the chic small businesses that line Main Street. The city of Laurel is located 25 minutes from Baltimore, 25 minutes from Washington, the city of Laurel is going to continue to grow just because of the market that we're in and where we're located. Economic development is really the engine that kind of makes the, the city run. It's the local businesses and attractions that really bring citizens to Laurel and keep them here uh, for many years to come. The city is continuing to make sure that this is a wonderful community for the citizens and business owners by providing top-notch services to the community as a whole. What I'd really like to see for Laurel to grow is towards a destination spot and just really enjoy Laurel for uh, what it is, which is a great place to be. La ciudad de Laurel es una gran ciudad para vivir, trabajar, jugar y formar una familia. Visita Laurel. And keeping the focus on growing economic opportunity now, San Rafael in California is focusing on economic growth and sustainability. San Rafael is located 15 miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. We're a town of about 65,000 people. And we are both the geographic center of Marin County as well as the economic center, and I would say the entertainment center and the most vibrant of all the cities in Marin. Uh, let me tell you that this is such a beautiful community. I love it dearly because everyone who lives here, we just love to enjoy our culture within ourselves and be able to transmit some of that to the rest of Marin County and everyone else. One of the biggest challenges that we have worked working with with the city has been the lightning. There were many areas in the community that there was just no light, which uh, invited people to make wrong decisions and, uh, and do wrong things to some of the residents. I am really happy that there is a path now where we feel that uh, we are part of the conversations. Community partnerships are so important to San Rafael. We can't do the work alone. We have to do it truly in partnership, in collaboration with our community. A story of limitless potential, that's Greeley, Colorado, where big city amenities meet a close-knit community spirit. Let's see what makes Greeley a blueprint for community growth. When we look at the foundation of Greeley, it is really focused in on the people of our community. That's the employees within our organization and the people that we serve on a continuous basis. Alquist 3D is a 3D printing construction company created in order to solve the housing crisis that we find here in America and around the world. We're going to be able to train people in just a matter of weeks on how to be compliant with 3D printing. So in partnership with Ames, we have made Greeley, Colorado the epicenter of the 3D printing movement. We're talking about legacy work, really enhancing the quality of life for individuals within this community and creating opportunities is the key thing that we all are driven towards. If you want to see how a community truly can grow and do it 
in a fashion that truly uplifts the community and, so, and is supported throughout the organization, take a look at Greeley, Colorado, because that community has truly laid out a clear plan, a blueprint, roadmap, of how they plan on achieving that as an organization. And as we aim to build better communities, for many vulnerable residents, that starts with just having a place to live. But the lack of affordable housing continues to be a vexing challenge for municipal and county managers. We face a pretty dire state of affordable housing right now in the country. There are estimates that we have a shortfall of anywhere from five and a half to seven million units that are affordable to low income people. Right now in the United States, there's no place where a person earning a minimum wage can afford a two bedroom rental apartment. So that really paints a pretty grim picture of how people can attain and maintain stable housing and keep it affordable. The climate risk that is facing all of us really hits low income people the hardest. It's not only the fact that more people who live in subsidized rental units live in harm's way, so a, a higher share of subsidized units are in areas that are at high risk of natural disasters, but it's also that when disasters occur, um, it really wipes out the very limited financial security that many low income households have. Poverty is not what causes eviction. Eviction is actually what causes poverty. We had a session today um, talking about how to create climate-friendly, affordable housing, particularly as a part of um, encouraging more economic mobility. And we had full room, lots of people in the room um, interested in the topic, and I think we're ready to take action. There's a lot of things that local leaders can do. First and foremost, it's really zoning in on the problem and identifying the fact that we have a shortfall of these affordable housing units in our communities. So that means looking at your zoning code. What are you doing to allow for more multifamily construction that can bring online more accessible units to more people. And I think the other thing that local leaders can do is be honest about the climate risks that they face. You know, if it's flooding, if it's wildfires, if it's, if it's hurricanes, take an understanding of what that means and, and then make steps accordingly. Whether that means starting to relocate critical facilities out of harm's way, think about different development patterns, or just frankly encouraging more people to be aware of the climate risks. I think the obstacles that local leaders face really, first of all, everybody knows we're in a financial crunch right now, so it's, it's challenging, but there's also people who want to um, zone for more multifamily housing or accessory dwelling units are faced by community members who don't want change. Uh, the NIMBYs come out to local meetings and, and say that, you know, we don't want uh, our communities to look any different, but the reality is that we're facing a very different future than we have faced in our past, and we need to change our communities to respond to that future. Lindsay Pollock is recognized as the leading voice on millennials and the multi-generational workplace. Lindsay works with both young professionals and the organizations that want to recruit and retain them. Let's see her roadmap for the future of work. You said, my boss said my career is a marathon, not a sprint. Fine, if my career is a marathon, what mile am I on and how fast am I going? We have five generations in the workplace for the first time in history. And generational diversity to me is a positive approach to that five generation workforce where we see each generation as having value and needing to be communicated with and appreciated. So my job today was to talk about the five generations in the workplace and how we can use what I call remixes to attract all generations. A remix is taking the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things and not saying one is better or worse, good or bad, but finding ways to combine the two in order to satisfy and challenge everybody in the workplace together, remixes. The biggest challenge is the stereotyping that we do. Oh, all young people want to use technology. All older, older people are resistant to technology. They don't want what I wanted. Instead of actually asking people what their perspectives are, talk to the younger generation. Talk to your young employees, ask them why they came to work with you. Talk to high school students, college students, professors in your area, and say, what are the trends among young people? I think every leader of X or boomer or traditionalist generation should have a reverse mentor, which is a millennial or Gen Z who talks to them about their experience, get to know them and understand their perspectives. They will respect yours if you respect theirs. 
number one factor in attracting any generation, but particularly young people, is to focus on purpose. Why do we do the work that we do? And I can't think of any industry more than local government where you get to see the results of your work doubling down, talking about that, engaging young people with the outcome of the work, I think is the best way to recruit all generations, but particularly millennials and Gen Z. We wrap things up today in Opelika, Florida, where a commitment to safety and thriving culture blends with Moorish architecture to make this urban landscape really stand out. Welcome to the great city of Opelika. We want to tell you about our historic city hall and all the renovations that we're currently doing here today. The city of Opelika has the largest collection of Moorish architecture here in the U.S. The entire community was designed um, and inspired by 1001 Arabian Nights. We are looking to not only revitalize the Moorish architecture of the city property, but of that of residents as well, so that we as a collective can join together and keeping this very, very important and unique heritage alive. What a lot of people don't know is we've created a building maintenance and beautification division, keeping our city beautiful and clean. We have done significant strides with our public spaces, keeping our grass cut, keeping our trees manicured. My vision for the city is to continue to grow and to continue to chart the path that we have embarked upon while allowing the unique heritage and the current residents to remain. Things look great in the Sunshine State. Well, that does it for this third day of ICMA TV, but we still have one more day to come. If you missed any part of today's episode or if there was anything you'd like to see again, you can catch the latest episode on the TV's place throughout the convention center on the homepage of the ICMA meeting website, where you can click through the playlist to find even more extensive meeting content on the ICMA conference app and on our YouTube and X pages, formerly known as Twitter. Thanks for joining us once again here today. We will see you right back here tomorrow for our final day of ICMA TV. Go have a great one.